Hello, everyone, and welcome to this HEC Paris Executive Education virtual conference room for HEC Insights webinar series. When joining the conference, you will notice that your microphones have been switched off. You will, however, be able to ask questions and make comments using the Q&A menu that you will find at the bottom of your window in the Zoom toolbar. The professor will only answer questions and read comments sent through the Q&A menu and will not be taking any questions coming from the chat. Please be aware that questions in the Q&A can be upvoted by clicking on the thumbs up icon and thus prioritize for the professor's dashboard. Make sure that you keep the chat for technical questions to our teams only. We would also like to remind you that the webinar is broadcast live on YouTube. We'll now begin in a couple of minutes. Once again, hello and welcome everyone to this HEC Paris Executive Education Virtual Conference Room for HEC Insight Webinar Series. When joining the conference, you will notice that your microphones have been switched off. You will, however, be able to ask questions and make comments using the Q&A menu that you will find at the bottom of your window in the Zoom toolbar. The professor will only uh, read, answer, read questions and uh, read comments sent through the Q&A menu and will not be taking anything coming from the chat. Please be aware that questions in the Q&A can be upvoted by clicking on the summed up icon and thus prioritize for the professor's view. Make sure that you, will, that you keep the chat for technical questions for our team only. The, web, the webinar is broadcasted on YouTube and as it's 5 p.m. now, I will leave the floor to Anne Michaud, Dean of Pedagogy at HEC, for her to introduce Olivier's food. Anne? Thank you, Adrien. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome and thank you very much for being with us today. I am Anne Michaud, Associate Dean for Pedagogy at HEC Paris, and on behalf of the board, I am very happy to introduce this webinar today. We invited Olivier Siboni, Associate Professor at HEC Paris, to talk about cognitive biases and decision making, with the example of the COVID-19 crisis. A warm welcome to you, Olivier, and thank you very much for accepting our second invitation to speak in our webinars. Olivier is an expert on the effect of heuristics and biases in strategic decision making and procedures to improve our decisions. So thank you, Olivier, for proposing this new analysis in our webinar series. Many participants are connected today, and I will do my best to help you with the Q&A session at the end of your presentation. And in the meantime, I am delighted to leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Anne, and welcome everybody to this um, discussion and webinar on cognitive biases. As Anne was saying, this is the field in which I do most of my teaching and research. And I was hoping today to use the crisis that we have all been and that in many places we still are going through, not as the main focus of the discussion, but as an illustration of what we can learn about how we make decisions when faced with uncertainty, how we make decisions at a time of crisis, and how we make decisions more broadly as business people. This topic is covered um, among other places, of course, in my new book, which comes out in a few weeks called You're About to Make a Terrible Mistakes, a Terrible Mistake, sorry, 
um, and subtitled How Biases Distort Decision Making. This is what we're going to be talking about today, how biases, cognitive biases, have distorted the decision making of many of us during this crisis. We're going to use this lens, this prism, as a way to analyze the crisis, but our focus is really not on pointing the finger at the way the decisions were made, but on learning how we can make better decisions in our business lives. For that purpose, what I propose to cover in the next 35 to 40 minutes, which will leave us about 20 minutes for discussion, is a set of observations that should help us to understand, and again, to understand not to point the finger, not to cast stones, not to designate the, the, the culprits, to understand what took place at three stages. First, during the awakening, the, the phase where we weren't sure what was going on and we gradually became aware that we were facing a crisis that was in many ways unprecedented. The response, which is the phase that we are still in right now in almost every place in the world, and finally, the future, what can we say about the future, a topic that we hear about all the time, how will the world of tomorrow be different from the world of yesterday? How will COVID-19 crisis change the way we do X, Y, and Z? So the awakening, the response, and the future. Let me start, obviously, with the, the first part, the awakening. What were we thinking? That's a question that many of you have had and that many of us have asked at the beginning of this crisis, what were we thinking? What took us so long to realize that we were faced with a very serious crisis? It took longer in some places than in others, but by and large, people have complained once they became aware of the problem that their leaders, their governments, their authorities had been too slow in responding to this crisis, too slow in awakening to it. The paradox here for people who study uh, behavioral science and, um, and cognitive biases is that usually it's the opposite. Usually we are, when faced with a risk that we are not familiar with, we have a tendency to overestimate a risk that has a low probability when it is a very visible and highly salient risk. For instance, when you ask people about the risk of airplane accidents or of terrorism or of nuclear accidents, they tend to greatly overestimate, not of course necessarily the magnitude of those risks, but their probability. If you ask people, how likely do you think you are to be you know, in an airplane accident or to be the victim of terrorism, they will give you answers that are several orders of magnitude larger than their actual risks. So we tend, all of us, to overestimate in our assessment of risk, those kinds of risks that are highly visible and low probability. For that reason, back in February and even in March, when cognitive science experts and behavioral science experts were asked, what do you think about this bizarre Chinese thing that still doesn't have a name, or that was starting to be called coronavirus but wasn't called COVID-19, what do you think about it? The overwhelming reaction about these specialists, and I have to say that was my reaction too, I was wrong too, was to say, well, you know, we are probably overreacting. We don't know how serious this is going to be yet. Of course, no one knows factually how serious it's going to be. But the likelihood is that we overestimate the magnitude of this thing because, in general, fear tends to distort our thinking, as you see here. In general, we are pretty bad at evaluating the degree of risk of uh, a new thing. And this was brilliantly summarized by uh, an op-ed published by Cass Sunstein, who is arguably one of the best experts in the world in cognitive science, who in late February was saying, look, if we panic about coronavirus, it's probably a cognitive bias. We neglect probabilities. We attach too much importance to low probability risks. Again, that is what happens most of the time. That's what I thought at the time. I thought we were overestimating that risk. However, in that case, those of us who thought that were wrong. And we were wrong because, and this is an important lesson about biases, because yes, this bias exists, but there were many other cognitive biases that were actually uh, 
having the opposite effect. There were several different biases, and we're going to look at them now, that led us not to overestimate the risk, but in fact to underestimate the big risk. This is a paradox, and this should make us all very humble about what we can predict from knowing about the existence of cognitive biases. Very often in a given situation, it is very hard or even impossible to know which bias is going to be present and therefore in what direction the mistake is going to go. In this particular case, there were at least four or five different biases that were pushing in the opposite direction. The first was very striking for those of us who live, who live in Europe. We thought this was a flu. Basically, when we looked at this and when people, including doctors like the one whose interview you see on the right here, who is the head of the Emergency Medicine uh, Practitioner Association in France, many doctors thought that the worst thing about this would be the overreaction of the politicians that would create a panic because this was just a flu and we had had epidemics of flu before. Contrast this with the reaction of the Asian countries you see on the left-hand side of the chart who immediately thought, oh, this looks like SARS. Now, this wasn't SARS and it wasn't the flu, it was something else. But it's a very different thing to say, well, it looks like SARS, maybe it's a less severe version of SARS, but it looks like SARS anyway, which is what the Asians did and which led them to respond actively and to do what many countries in Europe did, which was to say, well, it looks like the flu, of course, a more severe version of flu, but still a version of the flu. This is a case of what I call a mental model bias and what others have called framing biases or other terms have been used. But I like the, the term mental model here because depending on the mental model we apply to a situation, depending on whether we say, oh, I recognize it, it's a form of SARS, or oh, I recognize it, it's a form of flu, we're going to have a very different read of the situation. The facts are the same. We have the same information, we have the same number, the number of people who are uh, sick and the number of people who die is the same in both cases, but depending on the way we frame it, depending on the mental model we apply, we're going to look at it very differently. This, at least for the European countries who used the flu mental model, was the first bias that led us to underreact at the beginning of the pandemic. The second bias that led us to underreact is that we looked at the curve, and the curve looked like the beginning of an exponential curve, if we bothered to look at it. But in fact, when we look at the beginning of an exponential curve, we tend to extrapolate it thinking that it's going to look like this. We tend to extend the line, to draw the line, and we say, well, it could go a little bit over, it could go a little bit under, but basically we imagine a straight line. What we do not imagine is that it will look like this, which in fact is the exact shape of an exponential curve. What you see here is not a model, it's not a textbook about exponential curve, it's the actual number of people who died of COVID-19 in France, but it could be in any country, in the first uh, 40 days or 39 days of the epidemic. At the beginning, it was exponential. It was exponential since day one. It doesn't look exponential when you see it at this scale, but it was actually exponential if you compress the scale. It went from one to two, from two to four, from four to seven, not quite eight, then to about 15 or 16. Basically, it was doubling every three days. The problem we have with this is that this is absolutely counterintuitive. This has sometimes been called exponential growth bias, and I think it's a good term because we are really hardwired to think linear, not to think exponential. To illustrate what I mean here, to, 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 to say we're biased against this, I wrote um, a paper in, a, in a, an online magazine at the beginning of the crisis to explain exponential growth bias and to say, look, we are all victims of this, so we really need to get the numbers right. And I took an example. The example, just to illustrate it, was not COVID-19. It was a simple example of a compound interest calculation, which, of course, is exponential. If you invest money in an interest-bearing account today and that money produces interest tomorrow, then the interest it produces the day after tomorrow will include the interest that was produced today. So this is an exponential curve. And I took a very simple example in which 
I invited the reader to imagine what the result of the calculation would be after, I think, 40 years, and to write it down, and then to read the answer at the bottom of the article. The next day, my inbox was full of messages from people saying, you got this wrong, it can't be right. Of course, it was not wrong. I had checked the calculation, and in fact, I had borrowed it from someone much smarter than me who had checked it before. But the point the story illustrates is that even when people are told, look, this is surprising, you're going to be surprised, they are still so surprised by the magnitude of exponential growth that they think there was a mistake, even when they were told you're going to be surprised. So it's hardly surprising that we were very surprised by this exponential growth because the definition of exponential growth is that it takes us by surprise even when we are told it will take us by surprise. And you will see in a few minutes that it even took by surprise people whose job it is to predict this. So it's hard to get really worried about something that is affecting one person and then two people and then eight people or four people and then eight people because it still looks like very small number. What you don't realize is that in a matter of days, it's going to become very, very big if you don't do anything about this. That's exponential growth bias. Third bias that is very striking at the onset of the epidemic is that every country could look at some other countries and try to draw lessons from them. And most countries really did not. In France, for instance, and I'm going to be um, you know, trying to put the blame on the people I know best, um, we, we tended to look at Italy. And Italy was in a very dire situation, and we still weren't doing anything. The, the article you see on the left-hand side of the page here is written in French, but it's an op-ed written by a coalition of French journalists based in Italy who wrote in a French paper, what are you guys thinking? Aren't you aware of what is going on here? This is a tragedy and you're behaving as if you're immune to it. You must all be crazy. This was on March 12th. What was going on? What were people saying then? Well, if you look back at what people were saying, they had a lot of good explanations for why this wouldn't affect France. They were saying, well, Italy is different. Their healthcare system is not as well managed as ours. And it's an older country with a different demography. And families very often live under the same roof with several generations, which explains why the young will contaminate the old. This couldn't possibly happen in France. What's interesting about this analysis is that it's not necessarily wrong. All these facts are probably to some degree true about Italy. The problem is that we focus on the differences only. And if we tried to list those differences in one column and then take another column and list all the ways in which Italy is highly similar to France, the second column, the one of the resemblances, would be much longer. Because come to think of it, if you're looking for a country that is very similar to France, you'd be hard pressed to find one that is closer than Italy. But we don't look for the reasons we're similar, we look for the reasons we're different. Similarly, uh, in Brazil, someone like Jair Bolsonaro is looking for all the reasons in which Brazilians are different from other countries and kept claiming in this interview on March 27 that Brazilians never catch anything because their immune system is stronger. What we see here, of course, in a more extreme way in Brazil, is a form of in-group, out-group bias. We see here, we see it again in this page uh, in a very different style and done not by a populist politician, but by uh, a very smart academic. This is Richard Epstein of the Hoover Institution writing on March 16 that he doesn't think the uh, coronavirus crisis will affect more than 500 people in the US, will kill more than 500 people in the US. He updated it to 5,000 a week later saying, oh, I was wrong by a factor of 10. But of course, we now know that he was wrong by at least a factor of 20, and this isn't over, even in his second estimate. So in fact, he was wrong by a factor of 200 in his first estimate. What were his reasons? Again, it is unlikely that what happened in Italy could happen in the US or that what happened in China could happen in the US because different healthcare system, different air quality, different rate of smoking people, etc. Again, all those things are true. It is, or may be true, it may be true that in Wuhan, the air quality is poorer and the smoking rates are higher than in the US. But 
what Epstein is not looking at are all the ways in which the US is worse than China in terms of being exposed to COVID-19. For instance, a healthcare system that doesn't take care of a lot of people, a healthcare system, um, a percentage of the population that suffers from pre-existing conditions that is probably quite high, especially obesity and diabetes and several things that we know are contributing factors for COVID-19. So if you wanted to list all the reasons why it's not going to be better for the US than for China or Italy, but in fact is going to be worse, you would come to a very different conclusion. The point of these examples is that in those situations, we tend to look for the reasons that make other countries different from us. We tend to want to position ourselves as an in-group and then as an out-group. We highlight the differences. We don't look at the similarities. If we looked at the similarities, we would see that there are many similarities and that the reasons why what happened to them may in fact happen to us and maybe even be worse should be taken um, into consideration. So that's a third bias, the in-group, out-group bias. In corporate life, we see this all the time, by the way, when we see companies saying, oh, disruption has happened to many companies in our industry, but it won't happen to us because we are different. Or consumers have fled products of a particular type in many for many different companies, but our customers are more loyal than other customers because we are different and our customers are different. Every time we look for those reasons, we forget to look for the reasons that would lead us to the opposite conclusion. This is exactly the same mistake that we were making at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. Fourth bias that uh, has misled a lot of people at the beginning and that also is very relevant to many business decisions, it's called overprecision. Now to explain overprecision, let me walk you through this page here. This on the, on the left-hand side, and we'll ignore the right-hand side for simplicity, is a survey done by the website 538 of 18 of the best epidemiology specialists in the US on March 16 and 17. These are people from Harvard University, from Johns Hopkins, from Los Alamos National Laboratory, I and mean, these are real specialists, real experts, and they're asked, you know, you know how many cases of COVID-19 there are in the US now? How many do you think there will be on March 29? And again, the question is asked on March 17. So that's in 12 days. It's not a long-term forecast. It's a forecast 12 days out. Now, if you had simply extrapolated using the exponential curve that we've talked about earlier, if you had simply extrapolated the number of cases and the trajectory of the number of cases, you would have been much closer to the truth than these guys. On average, their consensus was 19,000. The real number turned out 12 days later to be 140,000. They were wrong by a factor of seven on average. But actually, this is not the main point of this chart because this is just a repetition of the fact that exponential growth bias is difficult even for those professionals to overcome and that they tend to think linearly when in fact they should project an exponential. What is interesting here is that you see on the left-hand side of the chart blue bars. Those bars are the confidence intervals that each specialist was asked to give. And you can see that except for the first three on the chart, the other 15 give a very, very, very narrow confidence interval. Not only are they saying they think it will be 10 or 15 or 19,000, but they're actually saying, well, I think it will be between 14 and 16 or between 17 and 21. They're not saying, I think it's 19,000, but I think it could be 200,000, except for the guy number three here who says, I really don't have any idea. By the way, if you look at the comments on Twitter when this is published, this guy at the third bar gets a lot of flack for this. You know, people make fun of him. They poke jokes at him for saying, you know, come on, be, be a man, be a real expert. Tell us what you think. Don't cover your backside like this by having a very wide estimate. The reality is people hate, people, pe people hate experts who tell them they don't know. But in fact, experts do not know. Experts tend to be over-precise. This is the bias that we're talking about here, over-precision. We all make the same mistake when we're asked for a confidence interval. 
when we're making a plan, when we're making a forecast, when we're making an estimate, the confidence intervals that we take are almost always too narrow, just like the intervals of those guys, because we underestimate the degree of uncertainty to which we are exposed, and also because we want to look good. And someone who gives a narrow confidence interval looks good, looks like a real expert who knows what he's talking about and who knows what the future will look like, Whereas the lone guy or guys on, on this chart who admit that they actually have no idea what is going on and who take a very wide confidence interval become the butt of jokes for not knowing what is going on. Again, overprecision, the tendency to overestimate to what degree we can predict the future. Let me just insist on one thing. This is distinct from optimism. Optimism is saying, there will be 20,000 cases when in fact there will be 140. So we underestimate the problem, the danger, that's optimism. Overprecision is being too precise, too confident in the number we give and giving too narrow a confidence interval around that number. We could very well be very pessimistic and too confident in our pessimistic prediction. In this case, you see both at the same time. That was the fourth bias that plays in the direction of underestimating the epidemic. There is a fifth one, and it's very important in our business lives as well. It is that we are social animals. In each country, there has been a phase where we were told, you got, you know, people, beware. Don't go out. Start to be careful. Start to practice social distancing. But we weren't listening. In France, that time was around May 15, just before the formal lockdown was enforced. And you can see here a picture of the gardens of the Louvre on May 15, where people had been told to socially distance. They had been told that there was danger. The restaurants had been closed uh, the night before. The bars had been closed the night before. So we were already quite explicitly and quite visibly in a state of emergency, in a state where people were told you know, change your behaviors. And you can tell from this picture and from many others taken on the same day that people were not changing their behaviors. Why is that? Because if I'm in Paris on that day, which I was, and I'm walking around the streets and I see people behaving like this, it is very hard not to imitate them. It is very hard to think that there is danger when you see tens and hundreds and thousands of people around you behaving as if there were no danger. We tend to get our cues about how to behave in terms of danger from the people around us. When we see people behaving as if everything is fine, we tend to behave as if everything is fine because it's very hard to think, I'm the only rational person here, they're all crazy. Conversely, only a few days later, this is a picture of Rome, but it could be Paris. When you are alone on those empty streets, you feel a palpable sense of danger. You feel a palpable sense that there is risk looming in the air, which is paradoxical because, of course, if there isn't anyone on the street, there is no risk. But because you are a social animal, you feel the danger and you want to imitate the people who are not on the street by staying at home as well. That was one of the reasons, again, we underestimated the danger at the beginning. This is the bias or in the, the consequence of the same bias is also felt in many business decisions. For instance, when uh, businesses or individuals operate in a bubble, uh, in a market bubble, you, you know the feeling of being in a bubble. All these people who are buying can't be wrong. I don't want to miss out on this big bubble. I don't want to be the only one not imitating the people around me and missing on this big opportunity. So I'm going to go for the bubble too, which of course is a mistake. Then the market crashes. And when everybody is selling, you're thinking, oh my God, if they're all selling, I need to imitate them as well because I don't want to be the only one stuck with worthless stuff when in fact you should be buying if you were rational. So this social pressure and imitation is also the root of many herding behaviors that we see in markets, both financial markets and other types of markets over and over and over again. Let me summarize what happened in this first phase. Yes, people told us, don't panic, we tend to overreact to small risks. And yes, that is true. But 
Our mental models led us to underestimate the risk, at least in Europe. Exponential growth bias led us to underestimate the risk. The in-group versus out-group bias led us to think the risk does not apply to us. Overprecision led us to be too confident in our forecasts about what was going to happen. And imitation led us to underestimate the magnitude of the risk as long as a critical mass of people around us were not behaving as if it was a big risk. All of this conspires to explain why it took so long in so many countries to realize the magnitude of the threat and why it was underestimated for so long. Now, let me move on to the phase we are in now, the response. And we've been in this phase for about three months now. Uh, and we are hopefully getting out of it in some places, maybe temporarily, maybe for real, we'll find out. But there's a few things that can be said about this phase. The first is that at least for the first six weeks and sometimes more of the crisis, it was impossible to talk about anything else than the health crisis. I'm not saying that there were a lot of more important things to talk about, but as Daniel Kahneman puts it in Thinking Fast and Slow, nothing in life is quite as important as you think it is while you are thinking about it. This is the problem that he calls the focusing illusion. The focusing illusion leads us to underestimate other aspects of the problem that we're not talking about when we're talking about it. And we were talking about nothing else. What you see on the left-hand side here is the airtime devoted by a number of media in France, it could be the same anywhere, to the COVID-19 crisis, when 75 to 80% of the airtime is devoted to the COVID-19 crisis and specifically to the health dimension of the crisis, it's very hard to talk about anything else. It's even very hard to have a rational conversation about the downsides or the risks or the costs of the policies that we're putting in place to respond to this emergency. Because yes, of course, it is an emergency and it requires a response. But to take a literary, and literary analogy, just because we are rereading the plague does not mean that we should forget the grapes of wrath. What was very clear from the beginning of the crisis was that this would trigger a massive economic crisis, a crisis of unprecedented proportion, the Grapes of Wrath, as you all know, is uh, a novel about the, the Great Depression. And in many ways, the, the severity of the current crisis is unmatched since the Great Depression and possibly on some dimensions like unemployment in the US, unmatched even by the Great Depression. We hope it won't be as long, we hope it won't be as bad, but it's certainly worth a discussion. For several weeks, it was impossible to even have that discussion. Again, the point is not that, the, that there's a choice between healthcare and the economy, between saving lives and saving livelihoods. The point is that if we don't have a good economy, if we, have, if we sacrifice the economy, we also sacrifice lives. Death of Despair, the book written by Anne Case and Angus Deaton about the, uh, the health effects of economic crises and specifically of the 2008-2009 crisis, shows that we are talking, statistically speaking, about hundreds of thousands of lives that are affected, hundreds of thousands of equivalent deaths, essentially, that are created by, by an economic crisis of the magnitude of the 2008 crisis. This one is worse, arguably. So it is logically clear and logically something we should discuss that the economic impact of the crisis is going to be very large, but it's very hard to have that conversation while we are in the throes of the healthcare crisis. That's a problem of focusing illusion, a problem of thinking that what we're talking about, that we're focusing on is the only important thing when sadly there is something at least as important looming in the background, in this case, the economic crisis, which for a long time didn't get the attention it deserved. Another interesting paradox of the response is the epidemic of conspiracy theories and other irrational beliefs that we've seen proliferate in all parts of the world. In a recent poll in Canada, not a country known for the, the gullibility of its inhabitants and you know, probably representative of many countries in the world, 
46% of respondents in a survey believe in at least one of the top four coronavirus myths, which are, I'm not going to cite them all, but you've heard them, that Bill Gates is behind this crisis because he's hoping to profit from it by selling vaccines, that the COVID-19 virus was manufactured, that it was made in a lab, and there's many others like this. Oh, that 5G towers are responsible for COVID-19, etc. Now, where does this come from? This is a complex subject and conspiracy theories exist uh, outside of the coronavirus, but um, at least two biases and, and, and many others, but at least two biases are present in all those conspiracy theories. One is groupthink. We surround ourselves with people who think like us. We have an echo chamber for our views on our social networks. We have filter bubbles around us that prevent us from being exposed to the views of people who don't think like us. Another is confirmation bias. When we think very hard something, for instance, if we are ferocious anti-vaxxers, if we believe that vaccines are bad, then it's not hard to find reasons to believe that COVID-19 was invented or manufactured or in fact somehow benefits the people who don't think like you, who are your arch enemies, the manufacturers of vaccines. That this is crazy does not matter. You will believe it anyway because you believed it before and you will find confirmation of what you believed in whatever happens in the crisis. So an epidemic of irrational beliefs is uh, evidence of many, many biases that are present in the way we respond to this crisis. A third bias that we see, a third and last bias that we see in our response to the crisis is present in the debate that we see in many countries right now about relaxing the lockdown, about ending the emergency phase. And here, what is going on is very interesting. And it's very typical of the way we operate when we have to answer a difficult question. What are we looking at? What we're looking at is the curve we see on the left. Sometimes we look at the curve of cases. Sometimes we look at the curve of death. This is the case of new cases in France. It basically tells you the epidemic has peaked. It has now fallen back to a level that has very few new cases every day. So we are out of trouble, we should relax the lockdown, and lots of voices are now saying that we should relax faster because the economy, back to the previous point, is suffering. That is an interesting point of view, and I hope it's right. I really hope it's right. I really hope the epidemic does not restart. But in fact, we don't know because we're not asking the right question. We're not asking the hard question. The hard question is in fact to understand the dynamic of the epidemics. And when we look at the number of new cases to understand what it represents. What it represents is the famous R number, the reproduction number, which is the number of people that every contaminated person contaminates in turn. You've all heard about that number. And when we relax the lockdown, of course, that number goes up. But fortunately, we're told it doesn't go up very high, so we are out of trouble. Now, what we don't know in France, and I don't think we know it in many countries, is the composition, the breakdown of that R. And let me try to explain this simply. There's two reasons why we could be having very few cases in France now, a lot less than we thought we would. One explanation is that the enforcement of physical distancing, for instance, wearing masks, is working and that people are meeting people, but they are not contaminating them when they are sick. And therefore, we don't have many new cases because we are observing this physical distancing. If that's the case, we should end the lockdown very fast as long as we require people to wear masks because it basically means having more social contact is not a problem. But the opposite explanation or the complementary explanation, which is the first one on the page here, is that the number of contacts that people have is still very far from having gone back to normal. And that in fact, what we think is an improvement in the probability of transmission is simply the manifestation of the fact that people have not resumed their contacts. If that is the case, it is simply because we have not yet come close to coming back to normal that the situation has not gotten worse and it will. Which of these explanations is true, or in fact, to what degree do they both contribute? I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows, because we are not doing a very good job of measuring these two things separately, 
to measure them, we would need simply to measure, or simply, not quite simply, but relatively simply, to measure the number of contacts that we have. I know on my own example, on the, on the example of many people I know, that I am still limiting the number of contacts that I have with other human beings, not as much as I did during the actual lockdown, but a lot more than I did before the lockdown. So if the level, the number of contacts that I had was 100 in a normal life, and it came down to say 10 uh, during the lockdown, is it now back at 15 or at 20 or at 50 or at 70 or at 95? I don't know for myself, I could estimate it. Everyone could estimate it for themselves. We could know this number. We could have an estimate of this number. It would require some polling. It would give us very valuable information about the dynamic of the epidemics that we simply do not have. And therefore, we can't possibly make the right decisions. This is a prime example of what we do when we're faced with a difficult question. Our system one, what Daniel Kahneman calls our system one, our fast thinking, is very quick to find an easier question and to answer it. In this case, the hard question is, what are the dynamics of the epidemic? The easier question is, does it feel as bad as it was a couple of weeks ago? And since the answer to that is no, we say, well, great, it's over, let's move on. We answer an easier question, and unfortunately, the answer to the easier question is not always the right answer to the hard question. This ends the response phase, let me say a few words and just a few words before I hand the floor to Anne to summarize the questions that you will have, uh, I hope, um, uh, offered in the meantime, and I look forward to addressing those questions. Let me say a very few brief remarks on the future. And the reason those remarks will be brief is because I try very hard in this uh, current situation, and in general in life, uh, not to make too many forecasts, not to make prophecies, because in unforeseen circumstances, prophecies are very hard. And this particular situation is ripe with a number of uncertainties that is much larger than the number of uncertainties we're used to. There are so many degrees of uncertainties in this situation that frankly, it's very, very, very hard to know what will happen a few weeks or a few months from now. What is striking, though, is that this doesn't stop a lot of people from making very bold forecasts and very categorical predictions about what is going on and what is going to happen next. Open your favorite newspaper and you will find lots of people telling you that because of this crisis, we have to fundamentally rethink fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you think is important for you, well, this crisis is a reason to rethink it. If you had a problem with globalization, if you had a problem with inequality, if you had a problem with global warming, if you had a problem with animal welfare, if you had a problem with individual freedoms, well, whatever your problem was, it is confirmed that you were right. The COVID-19 is giving ammunition to you, is, giving, is providing fodder to you to explain why you always thought, why what you always thought was true. What is fascinating here is how many people can confidently tell you, I had not foreseen this crisis. I had no idea it was coming, but it confirms everything that I always thought. If you think about this for a minute, it's not very logical. I mean, how can something confirm what you always thought and yet, you hadn't been able to predict that something. It seems that if you were so right about everything, you should have seen it coming. And yet, none of us seem to be making that uh, logical uh, step. In fact, I'm going to plead guilty here. I'm a prime example of this. I see confirmation bias everywhere in this crisis, but I was looking for confirmation bias, and I was looking for all those biases. And I use this crisis as a way to explain to you right now that it's the product of biases, which is the topic on which I do my research. So you could rightly accuse me of falling into the very trap that I am describing here. You would be very right. I hope that what saves me in this case is that, in fact, those biases could be identified and were identified by me and by others at the very beginning of this crisis, and that I am admitting freely to having been wrong on many dimensions on this, 
So at least I try to take some distance from my own confirmation biases, but I'm very aware that I'm subject to them as well. So confirmation bias is a very powerful force in a situation like this. And there is another one, which is hindsight bias. Whatever happens, we always think that, in fact, once it has happened, it was obvious. It is very striking how many people today are absolutely convinced that this crisis should have been managed differently. And there are even hundreds of people in France, for instance, and I'm sure it's the same in all of your countries, who are starting lawsuits, accusing their government of having poorly managed the crisis and telling them, you should have known, you should have known better, you should have foreseen better. All these people are saying, basically, I didn't know, I had no idea, but you should have known, because now that we know what has happened, now that we can see in the rear view mirror, we knew what would happen, you must have known what would happen. This is called hindsight bias. In hindsight, it's very difficult to remember the degree of uncertainty in which we lived and to imagine what could have happened if we had not, been, if we had not done the things we have done. It's very hard to imagine the counterfactual. This makes it very hard to be a leader in times like this because whatever you do, you will get the blame. If you do too much, it will seem obvious that you should have known you were doing too much. If you do too little, it will seem obvious that you should have known you should have done more. So it will be very, very hard to resist the temptation to blame people in hindsight. But really, we should try. Because remember the degree of uncertainty that we were facing at the beginning of this crisis. It was really, really high. And it is still high today. And again, we tend to fall for hindsight bias. In summary, let me just try to offer a couple of pieces of advice that we can learn from this crisis for decision makers. The first is beware your mental models. Look at the facts, but be aware that when you're looking at the facts, you are looking at the facts through the prism of your mental model. For instance, I'm looking at the curve of death and, oh yes, it looks like the flu, or I'm looking at the curve of death and, oh my God, it looks like SARS. This distorts your thinking, so focus on the facts and the facts alone and try to look at them with several different mental models. The second lesson is sometimes keep calm and carry on is actually not a good idea. Telling people not to panic is usually good advice, but leaders don't wait to buy insurance against the worst case scenarios. To be a leader is sometimes to be prepared to say, you know what, we don't know what's going to happen, we better be careful. When we're thinking about very uncertain domains, it's very useful to imagine, to anticipate a range of scenarios, including the worst case scenarios, and to prepare for the worst case scenarios by insuring against them without waiting. Recognizing uncertainty does not mean wait and see. Recognizing uncertainty means act based on the uncertainty because uncertainty puts a premium on the value of early action. Uncertainty basically increases the value of insurance. The third idea is this uncertainty you need to learn to live with. We hate uncertainty. Everybody makes confident forecasts about what is going to happen now. The truth is nobody knows anything. I don't know. You don't know. The experts don't know. No one has any idea what is going to happen with this pandemic in September or in December, or next year, or the year after that. We can have scenarios. We should, in fact, have lots of scenarios. And for your business, it's the same. You should have a range of scenarios. You should have best case scenarios. You should have worst case scenarios. And you should plan for all those scenarios with portfolios of actions that are going to serve you well in uh, whatever scenario comes about. And finally, to end on a note of hope, when I talk about having scenarios and making plans, very often the objection I get, and maybe some of your questions are going to be about that, is what's the point of making predictions that we know are going to be wrong? If we are in such uncertainty, why bother to make plans? And the answer is because they actually will be useful anyway. A brilliant story about this, which you may have heard, is that France was able to save hundreds of lives by carrying 
very, very sick people, um, you know, intubated, intubated people under life support in TGVs, in high-speed trains from one part of the country to another part of the country where we still had hospital capacity, which is an incredible logistical feat. How were the hospitals and the railways able to carry this out? Simply because they had plans for it. They had rehearsed this thing. And why did they have plans for it? Not because they had anticipated COVID-19, of course, because they had planned for a terrorist attack. Now, the terrorist attack, fortunately, did not happen. But something else happened, and the plan that was done for one thing turned out to be very useful for another. This is what President Eisenhower had in mind when he said this famous sentence, plans are useless, but planning is irreplaceable. Plans are useless because we don't know what is going to happen, and most likely the scenario we had in mind is not going to materialize. But planning is indispensable because the plans we have and the readiness that they have created mentally will be highly valuable in whatever scenario comes about. These were the four lessons I wanted to leave you with. And with this, I suggest that we now discuss the observations and questions that I hope Anne has collected and we, we have many of them. Yes, thank you very much, Olivier. Well, I collected many questions, so I tried to organize them a little. So uh, to give... Um, I hope uh, no one will feel that I betrayed the questions, but I try to summarize as much as possible. First one, you have a lot of questions about, of course, trying to avoid these biases. So you answered, of course, uh, partly in your, in your last part about the future, but I, I think still maybe you want to uh, develop a little bit on this. Um, so many, uh, Many questions are about the fact that we're prone to biases at the individual, individual level. And uh, how can we uh, improve our safeguards to uh, avoid them? And then there's another dimension to this, I guess, that might be of interest, is that these biases are, of course, as well at the society level. And how can we also uh, sort of avoid them at the larger scale? If you want to these are these are great questions, and this is a very active field of research for many researchers in HEC and in other places. And this is the heart of the research that I describe uh, specifically in the book you see here called "You're About to Make a Terrible Mistake." It's about how you can actually improve your decision-making processes to fight biases. The basic idea is very simple. All these biases I've talked about are more or less universal. Right? That's why they are called biases. They are shared errors. They are mistakes that we all tend to make. We can try to learn to avoid them. There is some promising research about some very specific biases that suggests that we can try people to, we can train people to try to recognize those biases. But it's very unlikely that you will be, or that I will be, or that anyone will be able to overcome all their biases all the time. The reason those biases are biases is that they are in fact quite prevalent and quite universal and quite strong. So our hope of making better decisions is not to overcome our biases as individuals, it's to build organizations, to build decision-making processes, to build what I call a decision architecture that actually helps us to make better decisions despite those biases. There's an illustration of this that I quite like, at, at the very beginning of the, uh, the, the work on biases that Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky and others were doing, there was a frequent criticism that was addressed to them, which was, if we're so biased, how did we make it to the moon? You know, how can human beings with all those flaws and all those fallibilities and all those systematic errors, how can they accomplish all the great things that they accomplish all the time? And the answer, obviously, that was um, given in that particular conversation was, you know, it's not a human being that made it to the moon, it's NASA. It's a big organization that tries to have as rational as possible decision processes, that has methods to make decisions, that try to make decisions as impervious to the biases of individuals as possible, basically, the organization can be a lot better than the people that compose it. Some people call this collective intelligence. 
I try to avoid that phrase because it's ambiguous. It means lots of very different things. I prefer to call it a good decision-making method, to call it teamwork and process. So basically, the two pillars that are going to help you overcome biases in your organization are teamwork, having people around you who work with you, whom you trust, and who do not necessarily have the same view on a particular situation that you have. Suppose, for instance, that at the beginning of this crisis, you have someone on your team who is from Asia and who says, hey, this looks like SARS. Now, that would help, wouldn't it? Because someone on your team would be seeing things very differently from you. You would say, well, it looks like the flu, no big deal. But someone on the team would be saying, well, actually, it also looks like SARS. Now, that forces you to look at things differently. That's the first pillar, teamwork. The second pillar is method. Once you have determined that you have two different views on this crisis, is it a SARS or is it a flu? You need to get the facts. You need to have a rigorous method to decide which view is actually appropriate to the situation. And if you had done that at the time, you would have seen that in fact, the lethality of this disease and everything we knew about it at the time made it in fact, a lot worse than the flu. Not as bad as SARS, but a lot worse than the flu. So basically these two pillars of the, of the approach to what I call decision architecture will help you overcome your biases, have a good team, have collegiality, have a collective decision-making process and have method, rigor, discipline in that collective decision-making process. And I, I go in great length in the book about specific techniques to do that, but we don't have the time to cover this here, obviously. Okay, thank you very much, Olivier. Um, I will go on another series of questions. Many uh, people were asking around the idea of anticipation and preparing for extreme situations. So first part is, how to anticipate and better prepare organizations to the unexpected. So that's the first part. And second is, um, can it be the case that preparing for extreme scenarios is very expensive for organizations? And um, so how much do we get into that? So I like the way this question is formulated because it is typical of the um, the aversion to uncertainty that we have. You can, in, in the second part of your question, you hear someone saying, ah, what's the point of planning for all those scenarios? It's going to be very expensive. We're immediately looking for reasons not to do it. Basically, we're so wedded to the idea of a single future, you know, to the idea that we can predict the future, that as soon as someone annoyingly like me says, you don't know, you have no idea what the future looks like. We say, yeah, but yeah, what's the point of predicting for all those scenarios because it will be too expensive to think about them anyway or because we can't imagine them anyway. The reality is that we are in uncertainty all the time. Most of the time we can fake it. We can pretend that we sort of know what is going on and our median scenario, the basic plan that we're making is not going to be too far from reality. From time to time, a big crisis like this one reminds us that we live all the time in a state of uncertainty. Every decision that we make, every plan that we make, basically is fraught with risk. And that is fine, as long as you actually recognize it and you live with it. So the practical way to do this, and this will answer the first part of the question, Anne, is be very humble about what you can and cannot forecast develop a range of scenarios around the key uncertainties. This isn't actually very difficult because for your business, whatever it is, the number of questions that actually drive the core scenarios is not very large. You, I, I listed a lot of dimensions of uncertainty on this funnel chart that you saw a few minutes ago, but not all these questions matter to everyone. All these questions matter if you're a macroeconomist, but if you are a restaurant, what matters is, when will I be able to reopen? What measures will be imposed on me? And will the customers come back? Basically, with those three questions, you can create two, three, five scenarios, and you can know what happens in various scenarios. Now, there is a scenario. Let's take this very concrete example of a restaurant. There is a scenario in which you are not allowed to reopen in a normal way anytime soon. What do you do? Well, you can shut down and take your losses or you can convert into some sort of delivery or catering business, and you don't have to wait to do it. Because if the scenario turns out to be that, 
it won't have cost you a lot of money to prepare yourself for that future. And you will be much better equipped to live in that particular future than the people who wait to convert themselves to whatever the future is. So develop more scenarios, acknowledge the uncertainty, embrace the uncertainty, be aware that the future is inherently unpredictable, recognize that you don't have a single plan but a range of plans, and try to build a number of initiatives that cover all those various plans. Is it less comfortable than having a single plan? Absolutely. No question about that. Can we make a single plan today? Well, if you can, suit yourself. I can't. <laughs> Surely. Maybe, uh, maybe a last one now, short question, but I know it could be a very long answer, but a lot of people are asking about the nudging. So how can you, you know, once you know all this, how can you nudge better behaviors uh, within organizations and also within society? Like now, how can you nudge people to better behave? This is a great question. So um, let me first point people who are interested in this question to an online talk that you can find uh, by searching your favorite search engine, which I gave jointly with Cass Sunstein of Harvard University on the topic of biases and nudges in the COVID-19 crisis. If you Google my name and his and COVID-19, you will find that talk. It's a, it's a one hour conversation that answers exactly this topic. Um, just to give a flavor of it to those who aren't necessarily interested in, in spending an hour on the topic, there are lots of things we can do to nudge people to give little easy incentives to uh, have the right behaviors. Take something like masks, wearing masks in public. A very strong nudge for those kinds of things is social limitation, which I described earlier. When we see a lot of people wearing masks, when we see prominent people wearing masks, we will wear masks. When we see a president not wearing a mask in a crowd, that sends the wrong signal. So if we want to nudge people to have the right behavior, let's start with example. It's very simple. There are, of course, lots of other examples that we can have. Um, and uh, Cass Sunstein and, and I uh, talk about a lot of those in the, specifically in the second part of the talk that I was uh, alluding to. So those who are interested, I strongly encourage you to take a look. And you're on mute, I think. Yes, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think we are right on time. So thank you, Olivier. I think it's always fascinating to hear about our witnesses in front of all these biases that we have. Thank but you, Anne, and thank you, everyone. That we can improve on this. So thank you for all your insights. Um, and thank you to all attendees for their very rich questions. Uh, I tried my best to summarize them. I know we couldn't take them all, so thanks very much and thank you for your extra references so that they can look at other answers. Thank you. Thank you all, goodbye. Goodbye.